Chapter Four of Freud's Theory of the Neuroses by Dr. Edward Hitchman, translated by Dr. C. R. Payne. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter Four: The Unconscious. Consciousness and the Unconscious Common Meaning of Unconscious Hypnosis and Double Consciousness The Unconscious in Hysteria Resistance and Repression Genesis and Content of the Real Unconscious The Complex The Free Association the association experiment determination of all mental processes phenomena of the unconscious in the psychopathology of everyday life the unconscious in wit and dream formation the basic presupposition for an intelligent penetration into the secrets of hysteria is the recognition of the nature and activity of unconscious mental life. As an obstacle to appreciating this stands preeminently the conception of the prevailing school psychology for which everything psychic is a priori only conscious, hence the speaking of unconscious mental processes constitutes an absolute absurdity. The observations of the psychoanalysts, however, compel the recognition of the existence of unconscious mental processes. The physician educated in psychoanalysis cannot do otherwise than reject the dogma of the psychologists that consciousness is the indispensable characteristic of mental life and hold fast to his conviction based on impressions gained from his observations on patients. The results of psychoanalysis really prove with every certainty possible in the field of psychology an unconscious of wide scope and great intensity. Right here it should be emphasized that this unconscious, as psychoanalysis has revealed it, has nothing to do with the term unconscious as employed in ordinary speech usage. This conventional unconscious signifies as much as unintentional, involuntary, or it indicates psychic elements of which one has not just thought which, however, are accessible to consciousness and by the concentration of the attention can every time be reproduced. Unconscious, in the Freudian sense, on the contrary, means something which one does not really know, while one is compelled in the analysis by conclusive inferences to recognize it. As already mentioned, it is chiefly the investigations on neurotics which convince the analyst of the existence of the unconscious. Nevertheless, there are certain other phenomena closely related to the neuroses suited to demonstrate in a much easier way the activity of the unconscious mental forces. Observers must recognize that there may be in one and the same individual many mental groupings which can remain fairly independent of one another, knowing nothing of one another and alternately splitting consciousness. Cases of this kind, which are called double personality or multiple personality, occasionally come to observation in patients spontaneously. If in such a splitting of personality the consciousness remains constantly joined to one of the two conditions, then this is called the conscious mental condition, the one separated from it, the unconscious. 
in the recognized phenomenon of the so-called post-hypnotic suggestion, in which a command given in the hypnotic state is later obeyed in the normal condition, one has an excellent picture of the influences which the conscious condition can experience from processes unconscious to it. Taking this as a pattern, one may classify the experiences of hysteria. Freud made use of hypnotism in the treatment of hysteria only at the beginning of his work with the neuroses, since he soon discovered that only a portion of his patients could be hypnotized, he decided to work with the normal condition. Proceeding from the free associations of the patients, he came, like Breuer in his noted case by hypnoidal conditions, to the discovery that those impressions which had been the occasion of hysterical phenomena had remained in wonderful freshness and with their full affect tone for a long period of time without the patient's being cognizant of these as he was of other affairs of his life. On the contrary, these events are completely missing in the memory of the patient in his ordinary mental state, or are present at most only in outline. By the aid of the Freudian psychoanalytic technique, it soon appeared that the splitting of consciousness which is so frequent in the recognized classical cases as double consciousness may appear in every case of hysteria in the form of a mental dissociation. Thus resulted the necessity of localizing somewhere else these ideas which were not present in consciousness in the customary figurative language employed in the description of mental processes. Freud has, therefore, in accordance with Lips, accepted the name unconscious. We speak here only of the narrower meaning of unconscious, as we might say the Freudian unconscious, or the unconscious of the neurosis. The meaning of the same can only become clear when one has recognized in what way the sum of its content was separated from the conscious mental processes. The patient betrays these pathogenic unconscious mental impulses only under great resistance. A force prevents their becoming conscious and compels them to remain unconscious. One can only really appreciate the existence of this force when one seeks in opposition to it to bring the unconscious impulses of the patient into consciousness. On this idea of resistance, Widerstand, Freud has founded his conception of the mental processes of hysteria. The same forces which today oppose as resistance the making conscious of the unconscious, purposely forgotten, must at one time have accomplished this forgetting and forced the offending pathogenic experience out of consciousness. Freud named this process, which he supposed dynamic, repression, verdrängung and considered it as demonstrated by the undeniable existence of the resistance, Widerstand. The repression came about by a psychic traumatic experience of special intensity and entire disagreement with the mental character of the individual, or, as appeared later, even a similarly established wish, instinct, impulse, becoming engaged in a kind of struggle for existence with the ethical and aesthetic attributes of the personality, and being thrust out of the conscious mental structure, as you might say, by an act of the will. There had been a short previous conflict, the end of which was the repression of the unbearable idea. In the field of logic, something like the rejection of judgment would correspond to this process. The acceptance of the unbearable wish impulse, 
or a prolonged duration of the conflict would have called forth a higher degree of discomfort. This discomfort would be avoided by the repression which acts as a kind of protective mechanism of the mental personality, as an expression of the instinct of self-preservation of the psychic ego. The dissociation of the mind into conscious and unconscious is explained not as an inborn weakness, Janet, but as a dynamic result of the conflict of contending mental forces. It may be mentioned here in advance that the repression tending to form a neurosis is one which has failed in so far that the repressed wish impulse continues to exist in the unconscious and waits, as it were, only for the opportunity to become active in the form of a distorted and unrecognizable substitute formation for the material repressed into the unconscious, the hysterical symptom. Compare chapters 6 and 7. The hysterical repression has its prototype in that previously mentioned organic repression of the first instinctive impulses in the child, which normally brings to a close the earliest period of polymorphous perverse sexual activity. In this there occurs the submersion into the unconscious not only of individual experiences but of a whole period of development, the continuation of certain instinctive impulses which were originally accompanied by pleasure is brought by the necessary subordination to cultural requirements into opposition to the goal ideas of the secondary thought processes, and now causes discomfort or pain instead of pleasure. Just this change of affect constitutes the essence of repression. The material in repressed instincts, sexual activities, wish impulses and erotic fantasies forms the foundation, as you might say the oldest and deepest layers in the structure of the unconscious. A second part of the repressed material comes from repressions in later life. This repression of later years comes about through the attraction of the old nucleus of the unconscious, while from the other side the repelling forces of consciousness again seek to reject this definite material. These forces acting from both sides aid the act of repression, which, when successful, is a normal psychological process. Through the domination of the unconscious it can, however, easily fail, although for the individual the repression succeeds here also since the repressed material now expresses its pathogenic activity from the unconscious. That sum of primary instinctive impulses which are killed by the original repression, the real unconscious in the Freudian sense, which furnish the stream both of the neurosis and the dream, is to be distinctly differentiated from that popular unconscious mentioned in the beginning, the combination of automatic half-forgotten unintentional mental processes. The psychoanalytic unconscious, on the contrary, contains nothing except repressed instinctive impulses, in the widest sense of the word, as well as those psychic formations which appear as offspring of these repressed impulses. Thus the nucleus of this contains the suppressed component instinct in so far as they were overcome and discarded in childhood. The sexual disinclination of the hysterically disposed individual causes all later sexual and erotic experiences to sink into the unconscious and join the early originally repressed material. 
the fundamental characteristic of the unconscious is thus its sexual character sexual taken in its broadest sense only one who has completely comprehended the theory of the neuroses is capable of understanding the whole life power and indestructibility of the unconscious the force of this is shown most clearly in the eternally recurring dreams and pathologically in the lasting productivity of the neurosis the whole content of the unconscious is since it is indestructible reproducible in full vividness under appropriate conditions psychoanalysis in fact some prehistoric event of early childhood long gone from conscious thought occasionally appears so unchanged and undiminished in intensity that one must characterize it as eternal the task of psychoanalysis is to find the entrance to the unconscious which is also the only way to make conscious the unconscious the difficulty of representing what is included under the term unconscious is especially conspicuous in the fact that when we speak of the unconscious of a patient we understand other things besides the infantile unconscious in reality the later repressed psychosexual material as one encounters it in the patient is not to be sharply distinguished from the infantile unconscious material the more remote descendants of the original repressed impulses may no longer lie at the bottom of the mass of repressed material and can often crop up suddenly in consciousness these descendants constitute what might be called flitting transitions from conscious to unconscious and would be about the material which freud calls foreconscious something which the patient either knows or wishes to know only momentarily which with a little effort however can be brought to memory it has proved expedient to call such groups of related elementary ideas possessed of an affect complexes following the example of the zurich school bloiler jung and others a definite complex is in every case the occasion and content of the neurosis it is the ruling power in the diseased mind and from whatever point one examines the patient he comes upon derivatives which have become conscious the conscious substitute ideas of the repressed complex hence regularly upon the repressed material since he is controlled by the goal idea of the treatment that the apparently most innocent and arbitrary thing reported has some relation to the pathological condition proceeding from this presupposition the analyst has merely to pay attention to the free associations of the patient coming as it were from the psychic surface to reach the repressed pathogenic complex if it seems to a critic arbitrary to consider the results obtained from such unguided associations as at all valuable attention must be emphatically called to the empirically discovered phenomenon which is of fundamental importance for the whole psychoanalytic technique namely that there is no accidental course of association that there are no free associations that in general in mental life as elsewhere in nature there is nothing accidental arbitrary not related to a cause but that every thought every association every mental occurrence stands in relation to its cause thus is determined or more exactly as the dream investigation shows is determined from several sides thus is over determined 
this causal connection science has never denied. Freud's service consists in having confirmed it by psychoanalysis. The Zürich School later furnished experimental proof of this truth discovered by Freud in the association experiments. The association experiment inaugurated by the Wundt School for formal experimental psychological investigations, which consists in calling out to the person being examined test words and registering his involuntary answers reaction words was elaborated by the Swiss school, Jung and others, in manner of application and utilized in the sense of the psychoanalytic investigations, so that now both meaning and content of the reactions are considered in relation to the test word and to each other. From this resulted, besides other interesting details, the fact that all reaction words which the person being tested gives to happily chosen test words stand in a close relation to one another and belong, especially in neurotics, to the prevailing thought and emotional complex. This complex manifests itself by quite definite tokens, while the reactions disclose it by the following peculiarities. Lengthened reaction times false reactions, disturbances of reproduction in the repetition of the experiment, accompanying motor phenomena, apparent contradiction, incoherence between test word and reaction, etc. These disturbances which the complex causes in the association experiment are nothing else than the Freudian resistances of the psychoanalysis. It is even possible to carry out in this field a physical control by the combination of the association experiment with a mensuration of the fluctuation of an electric current corresponding to the affect shown. The association experiment has thus confirmed the existence of the unconscious, the activity of the complex, the specific content of the etiological complex in the neuroses, and likewise brings experimental proof for the determinism of the apparently free associations which had been previously asserted by Freud. This comprehensive and demonstrable determinism in all mental occurrences is one of the most important basic principles of the Freudian psychology. It seems conceivable that there may be an universal human, as you might say normal, resistance against this limitation of free will which may lead to a resistance against the whole Freudian theory. The psychoanalytic investigations, aided by the association experiment, have shown with absolute certainty that in mental phenomena there is nothing little, nothing arbitrary, nothing accidental. In his book Zur Psychopathologie des Alltagslebens, psychopathology of everyday life, Freud has turned his investigations in this direction, namely to certain mistakes such as forgetting, errors of speech, writing and action, and the like, and could point out that these insufficiencies of our mental performances, as well as certain apparently aimless performances, symptomatic acts, are regularly well motivated and determined by motives unknown to consciousness. This is corroborated when one subjects these unjustly neglected minor affairs to a penetrating psychological consideration. The reason that the motives for such unintentional acts are hidden in the unconscious and can 
only be revealed by psychoanalysis is to be sought in the fact that these phenomena go back to motives of which consciousness will know nothing, hence were crowded into the unconscious without, however, having been deprived of every possibility of expressing themselves. These mistakes, in which an omission has the same value as an error of commission, are thus the disguised expression of a mental impulse which has remained unconscious and thus has a meaning that appears only in a kind of indirect representation. In similar manner, Freud could regularly point out behind the wit which has a purpose, thought processes which make use of this characteristic method of expression in order to half conceal half reveal impulses remaining unconscious the most imposing evidence and far-reaching explanations of the unconscious psychic processes in man are afforded by the penetrating study of the dream in the art of dream interpretation elaborated by freud the scientific dream interpretation inaugurated by the help of psychoanalytic methods produces the proof of the unexpected fullness of unconscious activity and thought formation in the mind and shows that all mental processes both of simplest and most complicated character can go on unconsciously everything conscious has an unconscious preliminary stage the unconscious mental circle appears as the greater one which includes the lesser one of consciousness lips the speech of the unconscious is rich in means of expression which are full of oddities for one who becomes acquainted with them for the first time dream, symptomatic act, wit, the peculiar manners of reaction in the association experiment, the enigmatical neurotic symptoms, and finally the seemingly free association which seems the more harmless and distorted, the farther it is separated from the repressed complex. All these phenomena owe their complication or difficulty of interpretation to the circumstance that the unconscious can express itself only in a form which has been censored by consciousness. Consciousness allows no direct representation of the scandalous, and since the indirect, censored, representation contains so much that is novel, paradoxical and curious for the uninitiated, so an intelligible resistance is directed against psychoanalysis which unmasks this secret speech. The resistance against this strange method of expression of the unconscious gladly clothes itself in an intellectual denial of the whole Freudian theory and is to be overcome only by repeated experiences which convince one of the entire regularity of the speech of the unconscious. Whoever brings the good intention to take this explanation of his resistance succeeds best in the study of his own dreams, according to Freud's directions. He can thus convince himself of the presence and power of his unconscious mental impulses, and thus succeeds in the best way in becoming a psychoanalyst. Dreams are really the first member in the series of abnormal psychic structures, the other members of which, the hysterical phobia, the obsessional and delusional idea, occupy the physician for practical reasons. Freud may thus rightly insist that he who does not know how to elucidate the origin of the dream picture 
will work in vain for a comprehension of the obsessional and delusional idea. Our nocturnal dream products are indeed compatible with full health of waking life, but have also the greatest external similarity and internal relationship to the creations of the insanities. Thus the dream stands in the center not only of the Freudian theory, but also of the psychoanalytic technique, and because of its fundamental importance will be treated in the next chapter in detail as an introduction to the theory of the psychoneuroses and analytic therapy. End of chapter 4 of Freud's Theory of the Neuroses by Dr. Edward Hitchman Translated by Dr. C. R. Payne